The following is an interview I recorded in late 2019 with Jake Sullivan. President-elect Biden recently announced that Jake would serve as his first national security advisor. China. ChinaEconTalk.substack.com. It's my newsletter where I translate viral articles from WeChat. In the past few weeks, I've done ones on U.S. China, China's struggling autonomous vehicle industry, and fake news on the mainland. It's free. Check it out. Jake likes it, I think. I like it. He likes it. All right. So this week's guest is Jake Sullivan. Jake has served in the Obama administration as national security advisor to Vice President Joe Biden and director of policy planning at the U.S. State Department. Jake currently teaches at Yale Law School and is the co-chair of National Security Action. Today, we'll be discussing Obama-era U.S.-China foreign policy, trade, and contemporary U.S. strategy with respect to the U.S.-China relationship. Jake, welcome to China Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. How would you compare your interactions with Chinese counterparts as compared to other nations? And what stood out to you about their system and how it operated from an international diplomacy standpoint? Well, first, there's a big difference between transacting business in English and transacting business through consecutive interpretation. Mm -hmm. And in the former scenario, when you're dealing with Europeans, you're dealing with countries in Africa or Latin America where many of your key counterparts speak fluent English, or even for that matter, I negotiated uh, portions of the Iran nuclear deal and that negotiation took place all in English. Hmm. You can develop a rapport, a rhythm, a capacity for really getting down to business much more easily than you can in a circumstance in which you've got to speak, wait for the interpretation, hear the response, hear the interpretation, and that creates its own barrier. So that's kind of point one. Point two is uh, Chinese diplomats tend to read from a script, and I don't mean that figuratively, I mean that literally, mm -hmm. that they will walk in with a set of pages with characters on them, that they will look down, read a section, pause, wait for the interpretation, read the next section, pause. They can just translate so it beforehand. I know I mean, and hand like, it over. This is like half an hour There's of a, everyone's there, time. There is a kind of crazy dimension to this where you're sitting there just saying, you know, just just hand over the paper and we'll, <laughs> we'll deal with it later and let's let's talk brass tacks. It's not official if it's coming out of the old man's voice. I so mean, there's, that's you know, there's what a it human is. dimension to this, which is it's not as straightforward or as casual or as comfortable uh, to be engaged in diplomatic discussions with Chinese counterparts. But there's also a strategic dimension to it because I actually believe it is harder for the United States and China to have no BS, brass tacks, discussions about bottom lines, given the way in which we talk to one another. I, I actually think it gets in the way of the kinds of serious, meaningful, strategic discussions that we just have to have if we're going to live together as major powers. Yeah. So what percentage of uh, headspace did China occupy in the Obama administration? And do you think in retrospect, it was sort of over or, or underrepresented? I served as director of policy planning for Secretary Clinton. And it was in the fall of 2011 that she wrote an article in Foreign Policy magazine called America's Pacific Century. And that was the first kind of major statement of US policy that President Obama then carried forward at the leader level of the rebalance, the pivot or the rebalance, this yeah. kind of view that the United States was underweighted in Asia and overweighted in the Middle East and we needed to shift that balance. And China loomed large in that. And so I would say for the first term of the Obama administration in particular, there was a decisive sense, a real propulsion behind elevating the importance of the U.S.-China relationship, dealing with the rise of China, and dealing with the Asia-Pacific writ large. In the second term, I think we didn't deliver on the promises that we had set forth in the first term quite as well as we would have hoped. And yeah. But that, that's partly because, as President Obama likes to say about the Middle East, it's like the godfather, once you think you're out, you get pulled back in, and, and there was the rise of ISIS and the like. It's partly because Secretary Kerry was rightly focused on trying to close the Iran nuclear deal and the Paris Climate Agreement. But also, I think losing people like Secretary Clinton and Secretary Panetta, who had both invested heavily in the rebalance as a major priority of theirs, had an impact. So it ebbed and flowed, I would say, over the course of the Obama administration. But by and large, I give our administration high marks for trying to manage this relationship, this complex relationship, in a way that kind of recognize both the cooperative elements and, and the more difficult, more contentious elements. 
So, you know, over the past few years, there's been a real dramatic hardening of opinion on both sides of the aisle with respect to, to China policy. And you say you give uh, you'd give the administration high marks, but there's definitely a line of argument out there saying that uh, the Obama administration was sort of slow on the uptake, that uh, engagement and like this whole sunny lands um, viewpoint was actually uh, sort of a fool's errand and um, that uh, the U.S. should have recognized the changing nature of uh, the Xi regime much earlier than it did. So um, do you I guess, why do you not buy into this? Well, I guess I'd make a, a distinction between the macro and the micro here. At the macro level, the whole thrust of the rebalance was that China's emergence, China's rise, was going to be a challenge that required intensive management, resources, high-level attention, and the rallying of our friends and partners across the Asia-Pacific to deal with in the security, economic, and political domain. So... We were focused on this issue, and we were not just looking at it as a totally benign, happy story, but as a challenging story. Mm -hmm. That's at the macro level. In fact, it's funny now to hear people say, you guys you know, were too easy on China, too soft on China, when at the time, the whole criticism of the pivot and the rebalance was that it was too hard on China. It was mm -hmm. too much up in their face, and we had to spend a lot of our time saying, no, this isn't all about them. It's about a larger set of trends and forces, which was also true because where the economic growth is going to come from, where the challenges of climate change are going to come from, where the kind of dynamism and and um, some of the great security challenges will come from is across the region and not just limited to China. But there's this funny shift in critique of the Obama administration from 2011 when it was, you're too confrontational, to today when it's, you weren't confrontational enough. That's at macro level. At the micro level, I do think we underestimated just how different a leader Xi Jinping was going to be from his predecessor. Mm -hmm. We did not see coming the kind of great man, new Mao, no longer just first among equals, but simply first, yeah. not primus inter pares, but just primus. And what that portended for both uh, Chinese policy within its borders and Chinese policy beyond its borders. So there, I think we had to make adjustments as we went. It's funny you mentioned Sunnylands. I still remember the decision of the two leaders to embrace this tagline, the new model of major country relations, or yeah. the new model of great power relations. And uh, it sounded so good, right? Okay, how how do you deal with the circumstance in which a rising power and an established power? Please no. Okay, you know, but... all, you know, okay we won't do Thucydides, <laughs> but, but in a way... Roughly, this was the construct, right? We're going to have a new model. It's going to be different from that. But what was funny was it became apparent very fast that President Obama and President Xi meant extremely different things by that. Sure. What President Obama meant was... Blame the translators, right? You Well, right. Yeah, exactly. You can rise into a system that we've built. It will make some adjustments to uh, you know, deal with the fact that you've risen into it. But fundamentally, you know, welcome to our world. And for China, the new model of major country relations meant you stay on your side of the Pacific and we'll stay on ours. And yeah. so they had to dis discard the term pretty quickly because it became apparent there was not a meeting of the minds about what it meant. Sure. So to what extent do you think this matters um, in respect to the U.S. being able to influence what's going on um, domestically in China or sort of China's aims? What matters? U.S.-Asia posture. I think it matters a considerable amount with respect to China's decisions beyond its borders. Mm -hmm. I think it has considerably less impact when it comes to the basic social compact or political economy of China itself. Um, although the one area, your podcast is called China Econ Talk, where that may not be true is in the economic domain, where if in fact... 60 to 70 percent of the world's economy came together around a set of standards and set of rules that basically gave China a choice. Either you make some adjustments or you're going to have second class status in this system. It probably would end up having significant impact on how they decide on the future relationship between the state and the market in China. Um, but one of the things that I've been advocating for the past few months is that we should premise our policy not on our expectation or hope that China is going to change its domestic policy, but rather on what we need to do sort of irrespective of the decisions in Beijing. 
because I think we've miscalculated over time as to just how much decisions in the West, decisions in Washington, uh, really end up shaping decisions in Beijing. Sure. So let's uh, let's come to a trade which you mentioned mentioned briefly. So you were part of the uh, 2016 Clinton campaign, right. which famously, infamously came out uh, against the uh, the TPP, which is one right. of the signature um, Obama uh, initiatives, of all, as all our reader, as all our listeners know. So, could you talk a little bit about what went into that decision and how uh, it looks to you sitting uh, sitting here in 2019? Well, it's interesting because, of course, I went into that campaign having come out of government, where for six years I've been focused exclusively on foreign policy, national security. So, for me, the paramount issue related to TPP was does this help us vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with China and more broadly in the Asia Pacific? Sure. And the answer to me in that context was yes. When you shift into a presidential campaign and you go from being secretary of state to being a presidential candidate, your field of vision broadens considerably. Mm -hmm. You then have to think about what am I saying to the person who cares about their job or whether their wages are going up about what TPP is going to do for them, for whom larger questions of geopolitical shifts and global rule setting are a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. And so basically the reason Hillary ended up coming out against TPP is in a world in which the Republicans were blocking investments in infrastructure, in education, in workforce competitiveness, she had a hard time looking people in the eye and saying, you know what we should do as kind of our first big economic act, TPP. That's really going to help because the impact on jobs and wages domestically of TPP was going to be a wash at best. And so from her perspective, she thought the basic idea of a multilateral effort to set new rules and standards to raise the bar above the WTO is right. TPP is the vehicle for it isn't quite right. We've got to do better. And frankly, that's basically where the conversation has shifted at this point. I mean, most Democrats today would say... We do need some kind of multilateral effort to deal with this, but TPP just isn't quite up to snuff. There are too many elements of it which are holdovers from or hangovers of an approach to trade policy that just doesn't square with where Democrats are now. Yeah, I mean, I just I remember the uh, Larry Kudlow going on TV and basically saying it'd be great if like we had something like TPP now. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, like, okay, sure, it would have been a wash, but you know, there were 10 other policies, right? I mean, were you surprised by the role that trade ended up playing in the 2016 election? Trade always ends up playing a pretty important role in a democratic primary. If you go back to 2008, some of the biggest fights between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, including a famous moment where Hillary in, in Ohio gets before a microphone and says, shame on you, Barack Obama, meet me in Ohio. That was about NAFTA. Yeah. That was about the barbs being traded back and forth between the campaign over who was harder on NAFTA, who hated NAFTA more. And of course, when President Obama became president, his views on these issues kind of reverted to the mean. But when you're running in a Democratic primary, the relative minority of voters end up having outsized impact. Yeah. I mean, broadly speaking, across all Democratic primary voters, they're positive on trade maybe even mildly positive on TPP, but that's not the constituency that really ends up mattering in a Democratic primary. Sure. The last thing I'll say about TPP is I think even its architects would acknowledge that today, starting from scratch, if you were to put together a trade agreement or a trade investment services, what have you agreement, um, that it would look somewhat different from the agreement that was negotiated back in 2015. And so I think what's incumbent upon the next president of the United States, if there is a Democratic president in 2021, is to come up not just with a way into TPP as it currently stands, but a kind of new uh, baseline that involves both Europe and Asia um, and touches on some of the issues covered by TPP, but goes beyond it as well. Yeah, we'll see that in 2027. And by then, whatever that will be, will be out of date. So I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's true on the one hand. On the other hand, TPP is essentially an FTA with some bells and whistles. And what's really needed at this point is not the emphasis on market access issues, but rather an emphasis on the sorts of things that were a bit more marginal in TPP. I mean, the state-owned enterprise chapter, for example, sure. was a step forward, but you know, was hardly kind of revolutionary discipline. Currency was absent. Um, issues related to the current 
set of questions around technology were largely absent. So it feels to me like there's work to be done to conceive of an agreement that isn't just kind of building pieces on top of the traditional FTA structure that kind of governed U.S. trade policy for 30 years. Yeah, I'm looking forward for my algorithm transparency chapter. Hello, yeah. uh, ByteDance. Right. One more thing on, on, uh, on 2016. Do you have any sense of you know, how Clinton would have hardened differently uh, on China as compared to what, what, what Trump has been doing? Well, I think that the three big differences between Trump and Clinton are, number one, Hillary Clinton believes passionately that allies are an asset and not a liability. Yeah. And she would have leveraged that asset vis-a-vis -vis China to a much more significant extent. Number two, Hillary believed that a good China policy was a good Asia policy. And while you have this Indo-Pacific strategy on paper in the Trump administration, the president doesn't conceive of that as a relevant thing at all. For him, this is all about point-to-point -point bilateral relationships. Sure. And you know the entire notion of the rebalance, including joining the East Asia Summit and other significant steps the U.S. took, was about embedding the U.S.-China relationship in a much broader strategy. And then the third aspect of it is that Secretary Clinton would have been focused on a much broader range of issues vis-a-vis -vis China than Trump is. Mm -hmm. So Trump cares about basically a narrow set of economic concerns that he wants addressed. For Secretary Clinton, those issues would have mattered. Broader security issues would have mattered. Human rights and political issues would have mattered. Um, and areas of potential cooperation like climate change and Ebola, both of which have been completely left to the sideline in the current U.S.-China dynamic would have played a much more central role. So uh, later this afternoon, you're interviewing uh, uh, Samantha Power. So um, maybe let's let's go a little bit or uh, a bit deeper into the human rights and China issue. So, you know, to what extent do you think speaking out um, with respect to Xinjiang and, uh, and and Hong Kong makes a difference, and maybe more generally, particularly with regards to uh, you know, great powers that the U.S. isn't necessarily planning on intervening um, to stop horrific acts. What what role should human rights uh, play in these sorts of great power calculations? Well, I've struggled with this question because it's so hard to say. I think for any given decision, at any given moment, the U.S. deciding to put out a statement or send the president out to say something or the secretary probably doesn't have a huge impact on China's decisions in Xinjiang or Hong Kong. Sure. But the cumulative effects of a U.S. posture on issues related to human rights, I think, do matter over time. They matter both with respect to the limits that even a country like China feels, you know, it may have to live within. Sure. And I think Hong Kong's a good potential example for that. And then it also matters for a much larger audience who is being pulled and pushed between you know, on a spectrum between democracy and authoritarianism, and for the United States to have some constancy in voicing its values, in pushing back against what it sees as uh, terrible abuses, crimes, repression, etc., is incredibly important to how that balance shakes out. So I think the U.S. has to approach this not thinking about it episode by episode dissident by dissident, year by year, but rather in the big sweep of history. And there, I think it does make a big difference if the U.S. is basically shelving these issues or is sort of constantly pressing on them, even if in pressing on them, it's not sacrificing the rest of the relationship. You said in a talk that, quote, the U.S. had a story about America's role in the world throughout the Cold War that was based on a defined enemy and a defined mission. Since the end of the Cold War, that tank has run out of gas. We need a new story for people of the world, what it is that we're all about. And I don't think we've done that yet. So my question for you is, you know, is it possible to have a strategy that gets people to care, um, but isn't alarmist, idealistic to a fault, or the sort of, uh, you know, red-blooded Jacksonian nationalism that could actually end up making situations around the world worse? I don't know. We don't actually have a successful <laughs> example of this in, in U.S. history. The, the two moments where the United States really rallied to internationalism were first in the era of Teddy Roosevelt, which was basically about a little problematic there. Jingoism, imperialism, and so forth. And then in the Cold War, when we had a great enemy. So it's either calling forth manifest destiny and a kind of 
crudely racialized view of American superiority and American destiny, or it's an all-encompassing conflict against an ideological foe. Those are the two examples that we have. So is there an alternative strategy? And part of the reason that people are so into the idea of turning China into that next great Yeah, it makes it easier. Then you have an answer. There's something in it for everyone, honestly. I mean, there's something in it for the people writing articles in foreign affairs who want the uh, the next We got We got George our podcast Kennan. numbers, downloads right. to think about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's something in it for you. Uh, there's something in it for progressives who are, you know, want to see much more domestic investment in the U.S. and can say, look, we need to have early childhood education because China has early child, childhood education, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think this is the direction we're heading because there's something in it for everyone, but that very much concerns me. I would like to say there is an alternative, which is much more focused on a set of threats and challenges that require the United States to rally the world, a la Independence Day, the movie, you know, like the aliens are coming and <laughs> oh, gotta, Jesus. Okay. you know, like that. Uh, oh, I'm, this is I'm what saying, we're going to. Then we're, then we're yeah, yeah, really, exactly. we're really digging the well, bottom right, of the barrel right. now. Yeah. So, so like I'm thinking, you know, if aliens came down, uh, yeah, we'd rally the world and that would be a great story. And I think people get totally psyched up for it to avoid global annihilation. Well, what's really so interesting how do you do is the same thing with a series of issues that actually do represent genuine threats, but aren't nearly as poignant as aliens, climate change, disease, the possibility of terrorists getting their hands on weapons of mass destruction, uh, the possibility of global economic depression, things that really do require the U.S. to rally and marshal the resources of the globe to you know, defend our way of life. But it's so abstract. Yeah. No aliens. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer. And because I don't have a good answer and I haven't heard one from others, I think we're creeping towards turning China into that answer, into saying, you know what we're going to do to have an organizing principle for U.S. foreign policy? It's going to be China. Sure. So, um, you know, Ryan Haas, uh, uh, the former uh, NSC director for, uh, for China, uh, he has this point that basically uh, people aren't buying it. The, the polling numbers uh, with the U.S. population with respect to China are like generally positive yeah. and like on the ranking of uh, what's important is like number like eight to ten. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is this just like an elite thing? Like, will this get translated at some point? Um, will it take a I don't know, not like a Pearl Harbor incident, but um, a real a real focusing event? And if not, do we just sort of like muddle along and not care about the world? Is the world OK? There, there were a lot of threads there, so no, no. But there, there is an interesting dynamic going on between the national security community and the political world of Washington on the one hand, and the American public on the other. And let's take two examples. One is the post nine eleven era of terrorism, and the other is China. In the post nine eleven era of terrorism, the demand signal for mobilizing everything around the terrorist threat was coming from people yeah. who were freaked out. And the national security community and even a lot of political leaders, while they responded to that, if you got them on a lie detector, they would say, more people die in car know, crashes, on, whatever. Is this threat yeah. really as big as everyone's making it out to be? The dynamic is kind of the reverse right now today when it comes to China. Yeah. The national security community is freaked out. The political leadership in Washington's freaked out. And the American people are a bit more relaxed about the whole thing, thinking, well, what do you mean China's our enemy? I don't, I don't get that. I, wasn't, I didn't get that memo, or I haven't gotten that memo every year for the last 20 years. So the question is, can there be a convergence? Can the American people be rallied to that, mobilized or motivated to that? And the answer is only yes, in my view, if something similar to what happened after the Second World War happens, which is... Um, as one senator said to Harry Truman, you got to scare the hell out of the American people. You yeah. got to, you, you know, this would require an active bipartisan effort to basically turn China into the an enemy in the eyes of the people. I think that that is a profound mistake. Um, but again, I think that there will be forces pushing in that direction. And while I agree with Ryan's assessment as a snapshot today, uh, whether or not 10 years from now we will look at the, that public opinion data and see a much deeper strain of antipathy towards China, that is an open question right now and one that should worry all of us. So we're going to take it back to 1947. To what extent do you think this was, you know, Harry Truman versus Stalin and Greece and South Korea and, and 
Poland and whatnot. I mean, on the one hand, Look, like I mean, I guess my take on this is the American people haven't changed that much in the seventy years since then. That back then they were super focused on Greece. And yeah, I'm thinking of it, thinking, coming I mean, it, saying it out of my mouth. And I mean, I'm like, where? Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think a lot of it was about the way that we put it, but there was a big difference. The big difference between the Soviet Union and China, beyond the active effort of the administration to take the case to the American people was that there had been since 1917, since the Russian revolution, 30 years of buildup around the red threat. Sure. There was red scares in the U S in the twenties. There was a view that the Bolsheviks could come here. There was all of that. So you had a fair amount of muscle memory, even in the American public to be skeptical of interesting the Soviet union in a way that if you look at the last 30 years, the story that's been communicated to the American people has been largely a positive story when it comes to China with one major exception that really rares up during election season, and that is they take advantage of us on trade and we should do something about that. Sure. But it's not an all-encompassing kind of existential struggle, twilight struggle, the way that there was this view that, you know, the Bolsheviks, the communists, the Reds could take Washington. They could be around every corner. You know, that yeah. was very present in the United States in a way that has not been true of China. That being said... The more you hear the FBI, the Justice Department, and uh, members of the intelligence community communicating the view that Chinese students, Chinese business people, Chinese academics are essentially all tools and spies of the PLA, the more you could see us starting to head in this direction. Yeah. And while I do think that we need a heightened awareness of and operational security about the presence of um, Chinese students and academics in the United States and sort of what they're involved with, I think we have to be very careful about, about turning that into a new McCarthyism. Sure. Because, um, you know, there are just so many downsides on, I mean, we don't have to. Yeah. The answer is obvious mean, there. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's obvious to you and me. It's obvious to a lot of your listeners. But I'll tell you, I mean, there have been moves in the Trump administration to try and basically shut down uh, the flow of, Chinese students into the United States, sure. which is just bananas. <laughs> so you write that it is incumbent on us to care and think about foreign policy on a daily basis and go back to first principles and explain once again anew what it is we want to do. Later you write, and this was with respect to Syria, but I think is reflective of your thinking more generally, that the U.S. should try to do more to achieve less. Um, so could you take these two uh, thoughts and apply them to this uh, discussion we're having vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah, I mean, a great example of this for me, um, just a concrete example, we can talk a little more generally about the relationship, is that the way U.S. policy has tended to work towards China is we state these totally maximalist principles, and then we aren't entirely prepared to back them up. So there's a gap between what we say we want to accomplish and what we do accomplish, and I think that that costs us. It costs us in the eyes of Beijing and it costs us in the eyes of the world. Concrete example, the uh, building of these artificial islands or the reclamation of island features and sure. turning them essentially into runways and, and military installations and the like in the South China Sea. We claimed starting early in the Obama administration, this was unacceptable. It cannot stand. They should not do it. And then they did it. Yeah. And if we had sat around the table and said, well, what are we going to do about it if they do? I think we would have quickly arrived at the end, which didn't really happen in the way that it should have. We would have arrived at the answer. Well, the only way to stop the Chinese from reclaiming this land is to physically coerce them. So Meaning, pa pause here. So why, why does that discussion not happen? Because there's ISIS? Because... Um... Yeah, I mean, it happens in a loose sense. But I think one of the things that stands in the way of effective U.S. policy is that we've had so many resources and such a preponderance of power for decades that conversations around how precisely you tie means and ends together, it's not that they don't happen. It's that they don't happen with the level of precision that is required mm -hmm. because there's an underlying sense that we can There's enough gas in the stuff tank. happen yeah. in the world. And look, I fault myself in this. I mean, I think I kind of instinctively have the view that if we want to see something done, 
by God, it will be done or, or by hook or by crook, we can, we can at least get close to it. We can push things in the right direction. I've seen lots of examples where that's worked, where mm-hmm. we've, we've stopped Ebola epidemics. We've saved millions of lives uh, through HIV AIDS treatment. We've negotiated peace. We've stopped Iran's nuclear program without firing a shot. Huge successes that involve the marshalling of American power and then the exercise of American diplomacy in concert with many other actors. So when you take something like this, you know, you sort of think we can lay down a marker and then find a way to make this happen without really fully thinking through what's the downside if we don't make it happen. Yeah. And in this case, the downside was the rest of the countries of the region basically looked at the United States and China in this context and said, with respect to the South China Sea, China won and the U.S. lost, at least as far as this issue is concerned now. What I mean by doing more to accomplish less in the South China Sea context is the most important thing for U.S. policy is the freedom of navigation through the South China Sea. And I think that we should be devoting more assets and resources to ensuring and reinforcing and holding up alongside our partners, the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And that puts the shoe on the other foot. China then has to stop us, which they will not do. Um, and then you're accomplishing what your core objective is without trying to accomplish something you know, above and beyond that. And you're in the driver's seat. And if I had to go back, that's the way that I would have tried to structure that approach. So coming back to the the first idea of of which principles we're going to care about and which go uh, maybe outside of the tent. So, so what stays? Well, I don't know if the right question is sort of what stays and what goes. I think what I was really getting at by saying that we have to go back to first principles is that we've taken a lot of assumptions for granted for a very long time. Assumptions that both events and Donald Trump have thrown into some doubt, including the value of alliances, the role of values in U.S. foreign policy, the role of multilateral institutions in America's place in them, the question of whether or not, in fact, we should maintain a positive sum attitude that we are better off, safer, and stronger when others are better off, safer, and stronger, or we should move to this zero-sum mindset that Trump has, which is if other countries are doing well, it must necessarily be at our expense. For 70 years, there was a bipartisan consensus around some of these assumptions that I think we've got to go back and look hard at and say, what are we actually trying to accomplish here? And to what extent do we need to make adjustments to these things to ensure that we are accomplishing that? So let me give you an example. In the economic domain, when we talk about advancing America's economic interests, that has frequently meant advancing America's business interests the interests of corporations around the world, indeed opening markets elsewhere to make them safe for U.S. corporate investment or multinational investment. Well, what if we said, actually, advancing economic interests is advancing a stronger, more robust, more inclusive middle class? And so what is the structure of our economic deals that is going to accomplish that? And should we care, for example, about an ISDS provision in TPP, which is really about helping our companies overseas be able to invest there? Um, Should we care about extending the life of biologic drugs in TPP or in um, the new NAFTA? Um, So for me, part of the question of getting back to first principles is about tools like alliances, and part of it is about objectives like what does it mean when we're defining the national interest? Who counts in that? What's prioritized in that? And I think we got a little bit lazy because we were sort of running on the inertia of decades of uh, of foreign policy work by both Republicans and Democrats. And after Trump, we have an opportunity, as I have written in one piece, not just to build back the way we, we did before, but to build back better, to actually look at this stuff hard and make adjustments, both for things that are different in the world, but also things that had gotten out of whack in our foreign policy. Sure. No, it's interesting. You write that the entire na- the country's entire national security strategy should be more explicitly geared towards reviving America's middle class. It's it's interesting because this is like definitely a, a response and echo of what has sort of happened post twenty sixteen. The critique I would give you is that this is basically Trump policy, but with like left leaning credentialed economists as opposed to Pete Navarro calling the shots here. What is you know I guess we're we're beyond zero sum, but particularly with, with respect to like international economic strategy, sort of gearing things more towards domestic economic growth as opposed to shoring up alliances. We did a show with Neil Ulrin a few weeks back, and basically he was talking about 
the 20th century trade policy was very much oriented toward uh, sort of Cold War, uh, Cold War dynamics. So to what extent uh, are we losing something by uh, focusing more on sort of middle class economic issues overseas? Well, I think one of the big shifts that's happened is that our allies are now stronger and more capable. Sure. And our relative capacity to just absorb all of the costs of an open international economy is less than it was before. Um, and so uh, I think we can make this adjustment without it coming at great cost to our alliances, but I think it is a necessary one. You know, Bob Cohane, who was a great champion of liberal institutionalism, of the United States being the guarantor of an open international economic order, wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs a couple of years ago called The System is Rigged. That's a Bernie Sanders line. But this is a guy who was talking about it in the context basically of saying that the international economic system we have built has been good for the very poor. Billions of people lived it out, out of poverty. Good for the very rich and not so good for middle classes, particularly in advanced economies. Yeah. And the problem with continuing to go down that line is that you will generate more instability, both in the policy of any given democracy, but also more broadly in terms of issues like the rise of populism, nationalism, and so forth, if you are not tending to that set of issues. So in a way, I don't think, I mean, Donald Trump is sort of a bundle of grievances and instincts. Some of his instincts are not wildly off when it comes to diagnosis, but when it's come to prescription, there's almost nothing you can point to in the Trump policy, either domestic or foreign, that has really actually been focused on the middle class or working people. Sure. You know, as a, a foreign policy generalist, I'd be curious to hear your reflections on the role of country specialists and how they should think about sort of the role they play in, in, in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, you were talking earlier about how you went from the foreign policy guy to the policy guy, and all of a sudden you were like, oh man, this stuff doesn't really matter all that much. But, you know, what... How, not that how it doesn't matter. Not that it doesn't okay, matter. But like, it matters enormously, but that there's a lot more. <laughs> it doesn't matter in New Hampshire. A lot Let's more going on. Okay. No, no. It, it, my point was not about the political salience of foreign policy. It was about all of the inputs to the American way of life. And particularly when it comes to our economy, where it is definitely the case that we are a trade-impacted economy and we need to trade with the rest of the world and be engaged with the rest of the world. But like... The biggest employer in most states in the United States is Walmart, sure. followed by healthcare. Fo you know, so a lot of people live in ways where they don't feel, in a in a direct or tangible manner, a connection to what's happening out there. And I think we have to pay attention to that. That's the only point I was making. Sure. So, what advice do you have to uh, to regional, in particular, China specialists? Well, you know, it's really interesting. My co-author and, and former colleague, Kurt Campbell makes this point that the China community used to be this sort of seaside town where everyone went during the summer and they all knew each other. And now in the last few years, all kinds of new people are moving in down yeah. the road. And we have bigger who, Twitter followers who, than who, like- Who've the... never been there before. <laughs> and you know, on the one hand, it's sort of more energy and dynamism for the community. On the other hand, it's like, who are all these people now yeah. who don't understand the ways of this place, the, uh, you know, the customs, the history, the knowledge, et cetera. And I think it's a great analogy. And I'm mindful of the fact that um, those of us who are generalists, when we come to issues like US-China, are interlopers. And that's because to really understand China uh, requires a depth of experience, knowledge, study that is reserved for very few people. And to really nail U.S.-China policy and U.S. strategy towards China, you need that. But I think you also need the generalist view on the various levers and instruments of U.S. power, the nature of U.S. democracy, um, the role of all these other issues, whether it's alliances or it's the functional areas of climate change from nuclear proliferation, global health, et cetera. So it's got to be a balance. We have to find, I think, a more constructive way for the those who have kind of engaged at a more general level in U.S. foreign policy to connect with, draw from, and leverage the unique assets of those who are genuine experts on China, of which I am not one. So 
say you could pause the world um, for a few years and no pressure to write magazines articulating, you know, visions of U.S. power, no law school papers to grade. Um, are there a few books that are sort of spinning around in your head uh, or, or maybe ones that you like wish you could read that haven't been written yet? Well, um, I really want to write a uh, TV show. So there's okay. that. I have some ideas. Uh, oh, come on, pitch. Who, golden, who knows who's listening? It's the golden era of TV. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can pitch here, but um, I really want to do um, the death of Stalin, but Mao. Um, right. I don't think that will ever be made. But right. um, there's like there's like 20 pages of that on my hard drive right, right. now. So yeah, but I'm. It's funny about books because I have talked to a number of editors and publishers over the last two years about writing a book. I came very close, in fact, to writing one, and then I just had felt like there's so much in this moment dealing with Trump yeah, dealing sure. with what we're up against that I couldn't cloister myself away to do it but I'll tell you what if Donald Trump wins re-election I am going to lock myself in a room and and write something uh write a book or write something at book length but I don't yet know what it will be I don't okay so um but stay tuned for the publication of that in the event of Armageddon all right fair enough yeah um so Say you were forced to, uh, um, to like, I don't know. Say you say you were twenty two again, and like ended up going a more, um, a more specific route. Were there any sort of like weird niches of of foreign policy that particularly uh, stuck out to you, and 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 why? You know, when I was twenty two, I was really deciding between uh, a career completely outside of foreign policy, that is, going home and being a lawyer in Minnesota versus going to DC and doing foreign policy. Sure. And so if I was back at 22, I'm, and, and I did, in fact, I moved home and was planning to stay there and then kind of things happened and brought me back out. But what's funny is that when I was 22 years old, it was the late 1990s and the US was at the apex of its power. And Independence Day was in theaters. Independence Day was in theaters. And I was, yes, I was thinking about how we beat the aliens. And so my view on what I wanted to work on was much more rooted in this kind of idea of how do we apply American power on these massive challenges, the early days of, of dealing with the environment and climate change, the early days of dealing with HIV AIDS. Like what I was really interested in was international institutions. I wrote my two undergraduate BA theses on the UN oh, so and did on I. development. So my interest at the time was much more about, well, we've settled out geopolitics. Like that's all fine yeah, for sure. now with, you know, some rogue states out there that were all the rage. Uh, so we can use American power really to focus in on solving human problems. And so I spent a summer in Kenya between my junior and senior year working on um, coordination problems in UN development agencies. And, and then I spent my senior year writing a second thesis on kind of development theory and, and what is the role of foreign policy in advancing develop, human development. So that's, maybe I should have just gone and done that. I don't know. But um, instead I ended up where I did. Last question sort of about like the, the, the context in which people grow up. I'm, I'm curious if you could sort of look backwards as well as, as forwards. So, you know, you've you know, when you were in government, we're working with people whose sort of window was not uh, the 1990s, but uh, the 70s and the 60s, 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how you saw that play out um, in the way they looked at the world and, you know, what you expect with your, your students one day, 20 years from now. Well, it's interesting because it's true that it was the 60s, 70s and 80s. On the other hand, so I came into government in 2009. And so for the senior foreign service officers, yes they had come of age during the cold war but they had won yeah and that was really the defining factor so this was a generation who had actually seen the berlin wall fall while they were in government had seen the soviet union collapse had seen the onset of the unipolar moment so they were maybe even more than me bought in rooted in this notion that the united states is uh, capable of playing an unalloyed leadership role in the world. I was steeped in that from childhood, but like hadn't actually been on the front lines of it. And I think that had a huge impact on the overall thinking of that generation. And, you know, as I've written, and when I think about my students today who have all come of age post 9-11, post Iraq war, post Abu Ghraib, post Edward Snowden, post the emergence of China, and 
they're all kind of like, what are you people talking about? Yeah. And everyone's on TikTok. Some days I've, yeah, exactly. <laughs> some days I think you're right. What are we thinking about? And some days I'm like, no, 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 no. I can explain it to you. There's a, there's an answer to this. Yeah. And I think that's actually a healthy, I get that healthy dynamic and dialogue that keeps me in check. And hopefully I'm imparting some view about a sense of ambition and possibility with respect to U.S. foreign policy to students who haven't seen a whole lot of that in their time. So George Packer uh, recently wrote a book on Holbrook, and this is actually an expert from the Atlantic piece. I don't think it was in the book, but he wrote that, you know, there's something else that would trouble Holbrook's ghost, not the end of our global leadership. It was never sustainable. And, 19, and in 1995, it was unique. But in the withering away of our example, we overestimate ourselves in almost every way from jingoism to self self-hatred to what you were saying two minutes ago um, with respect to America being able to solve all the problems in the world. Sorry, back to the quote. And all the while, we ignore nameless people in obscure places like Sarajevo and Banjaluka who still think we stand for something that they want for themselves. To adapt with grace to a cut in power is wisdom. It's folly to throw away the pearl of our real greatness. So, you know, with respect to this conversation, are you sort of worried that the direction um, U.S. foreign policy is taking is going to throw away that pearl? Well, what's interesting about this is that I'm struggling in debates with colleagues of mine around this core question of whether we, in fact, only do well after we've beaten ourselves up a lot and yeah. basically said, we failed, we're behind, the Chinese are kicking our butts, you know, the missile gap, the Soviets, the Sputnik moment, you know, what have you, that, that we need to kind of go through this period of insecurity and recrimination and a sense that somebody else out there has the drop on us to actually create the motivation and the energy to get our own house in order and to pursue a better foreign policy. This is the argument a lot of people make, and they've got history on their side. I worry, though, that we are headed down a road right now of insecurity and self-doubt that may not lead to the resurgence of confidence, but instead is a one-way ratchet. I do worry about that. And I actually think confidence is a commodity in international relations, and it's in short supply in the foreign policy community in the United States, in the United States more generally. And I, you know, it's interesting, when I read Packer's book and he got to the end and he sort of said it's, you know, Holbrook's career marks the arc of kind of America's role in the world, and in a way his death is the death of a certain role for the United States in the world. And I thought, no, damn it, no. The United States continues to have a unique capacity to be a force for good in the world. Even saying that to a lot of people, make them roll their eyes, make them think, what are you smoking? Yeah. But you know what? It's true. It's true. And there's a reason why people are disappointed in the United States, have their heart broken by the United States when they don't by Russia or China, because they expect more of us. Sure. And there's a reason why I think countries in the world and people around the world fear American retreat and decline more than they fear American domination. Not everywhere. I mean, we've really screwed up, particularly in places in the Middle East, but in many, many countries around the world. And so our talents, our capacities... And our ethos, I believe, I passionately believe, if marshaled properly and directed effectively and, and our ambitions trimmed appropriately, God, we have a lot to still give. And I sort of wish there were more voices unabashedly making that case than there are right now. Jake Sullivan, thanks so much for being a part of China.